Greet your neighbors and warn them that Laban is about to deceive them uh, if they are not careful. Laban is about, will deceive them if they are not careful. Of course, if they have been deceiving other people, then Laban is justified if he deceives them. So we must learn not to deceive others because if we do, we will be deceived. We will be deceived. And today we'll be seeing more about the consequences of sin. Uh, tell them malipo ni hapa hapa. Malipo ni hapa hapa. When you deceive others, you'll be deceived. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. Then ask uh, your mate to turn to Genesis 29. That is the focus of our study tonight. And let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We glorify your name. We declare that God, you are a good God. You are God who watches over us. You are wise and your God who leads us even to fulfill our destiny like we see in the case of Jacob. Even when we go through trouble, we know God you are with us. Even when we go through suffering, we know that God you are at work even in our lives. It's raining this evening. We pray that God you hold the internet, you hold the, the power, and that Father will be able to complete uh, the recording and the taping of this uh, uh, lecture. And that Father, even those who are meeting, uh, will be meeting in groups, they will be able to do it. And that Father, you are gospel will spread to the uttermost part of the world. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray that you're enjoying uh, the study of Genesis. Now we're in chapter 29. And of course, we are in lesson, uh, we are in lesson 19, so we've really moved. We are two-thirds way, uh, way through. So I pray that God is just blessing you, uh, seeing how God is dealing uh, with his servants and with the nations. Now, I want to begin this lecture by saying that sin has consequences. And although God forgives our sins immediately we repent, sinners must suffer the consequences of their sins. Indeed, we are told that we choose how to sin, uh, but we do never choose how to suffer the consequences. God is the one who determines how we are going to suffer our consequences. So every time you choose to sin, uh, commit sin, Know that consequences will follow and you are not the one to choose how you are going to suffer the consequences. Now, Galatians uh, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 clearly warns us, Do not be deceived. Uh, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So really, you will reap, I will reap, whatever we are sowing, whether good or bad. And that is really a very clear warning. Now, in Genesis 29, the Bible tells the story of our wise God allowing Jacob, the deceiver. Remember, Jacob, uh, that name means a deceiver. And indeed, he is a deceiver. He deceived so many people. Esau, he deceived his father very many times. Now, here we see God allowing Jacob, the deceiver, to be deceived by his uncle Laban. Our wise God allowed Laban to be deceived, allowed Laban to deceive Jacob into marrying Leah instead of Rachel after working for seven years. Can you imagine when Jacob was deceiving his brother Esau and his father Isaac? Uh, if only he knew he would have to suffer seven years for, uh, for his sin of deception. Now, I'm sure he would have had second thought. Now, here he is. He's having to serve seven years to marry this uh, girl, Rachel. But his father-in-law deceives him into marrying his uh, uh, elder um, daughter. Yet in all his suffering, God's wisdom was working to accomplish God's plan for Jacob. So even when we go through our suffering, when we go through deception, when other people mistreat us, even when we go through consequences of our sin, God's wisdom is still working to accomplish God's plan for Jacob. So you and I, even as we go through uh, suffering, pain, uh, we go through all the issues of life, we need to remember God is using all those things uh, to accomplish his plans and purposes. And from this passage, we learn that God's wisdom prevails to accomplish God's good purpose, purposes for our lives often time through suffering. God's wisdom prevails to accomplish God's good purpose for our lives, often time through suffering, often through suffering. So pain is there, and uh, 
is not always uh, we suffer because of our sin, but uh, suffering is guaranteed. Jesus said, in this world we'll have many troubles, uh, but we should be of good cheers. Jesus overcame the world. I have two divisions. Two divisions. The first one is God's discernible wisdom. The first 21 verses of Genesis 29, God's discernible wisdom. And then the second division is God's mysterious wisdom, uh, Genesis 22 to 35. God's discernible wisdom and God's mysterious wisdom. Okay, so let's go to the first division here and look at God's discernible wisdom. Now here by discernible we mean visible, obvious. I mean something you cannot observe what God is doing. And that's what we'll look at. But before we get into this division, let's recap. Now remember Jacob is fleeing uh, from the promised land and after the murderous threats of his brother Esau, who was plotting to kill him because you remember Jacob had deceived his brother uh, and even his father uh, and so then he can get the birthright. So he's fleeing. And on the way, as he fled, we know he encountered God at Bethel, at Luz, uh, that town which he renamed. And God made him the heir of God's covenant. So he's the heir of those uh, uh, God's uh, covenant blessings. Uh, he's going to inherit the blessings of Abraham and of his father Isaac. So at this point, God makes him the heir of the covenant blessing. But also God promised, promised to be with him wherever he went. God told him, uh, wherever you go, I'll watch over you, I'll bring you back to this land. And of course, we saw Jacob promise uh, to give God a tenth of everything that he gets. And now in Genesis 29, verses 1 and 3, we see God's discernible wisdom guiding Jacob to the well in Laban's neighborhood in Padan Aram. So that is God's uh, discernible wisdom. I mean, how do you go to a foreign country? You go to a foreign city and you land at the well where your people are and only God can guide you there. At that time, there was no GPS. Uh, there was no Google Maps. Uh, they didn't have all these complicated gadgets that we have, but they had God and the Spirit of God and we see God guiding uh, uh, Jacob to that well. And that well is the same well where uh, uh, Abraham's uh, uh, servant, Eliezer, went to so again God guiding his people. This is God's discernible wisdom that you and I, when we surrender to God's will, God is able to help us navigate through uh, the challenges of life. At the well, uh, Jacob inquires about his uncle Laban, and while he was still talking, again we see God's discernible wisdom, uh, we see God guiding Rachel, uh, this is Laban's daughter, to come to the well with her father's sheep. Can you imagine? Now you're in a foreign city, uh, now you're inquiring about your relatives, you are the right well, you're inquiring, and even as you inquire, one of the relatives, one of your relatives shows up. That again is God. That is again is God. And we need to know at times, we try so hard to do so many things, many a times we need to surrender to God's will, God's wisdom, God's discernible wisdom. From today, you and I need to be asking God, God, guide me with your wisdom. Let uh, those things fall in place that need to fall in place. So not only does God's discernible wisdom lead Jacob to the right well, it causes Rachel to come down at the right time. And for you and me, we can laugh at this because uh, not Leah who comes out. So God, God's discernible wisdom even knows which girl needs to come. <laughs> which girl needs to come out. And for Jacob, God brought out uh, Rachel. And again, you can see how God is working. And of course, when this uh, Jacob sees Rachel, something in him just kind of connected uh, with that family. In verse 10, we see when Jacob saw her, he went uh, to the well, he rolled the stone away, and he watered his uncle's sheep. So the connection, the engagement is immediate. You see how God, this is again God's discernible wisdom. Uh, we don't know whether this time uh, he's been told this is Laban's daughter, but at that moment, he just decides to do something about it. Now, remember when Eliezer went to the same well, uh, uh, it says uh, Rebecca who watered the camels. This time the roles are reversed. It's Jacob now who goes and waters Laban's sheep. Again, God guiding uh, everything that is happening there. This self selfless action of Jacob must have impressed Rachel, uh, just as Rebecca's selfless action of watering Eliezer's camel must have impressed uh, Eliezer. 
But again here, we see it's God still at work. He's the one orchestrating everything uh, for his glory and for the blessings of his people. In verses 11 to 12, then we see Jacob kissing Rachel. Uh, he didn't even wait for the pastors to say he may kiss the bride. Now he goes ahead here and just kisses Rachel and told her that he was a relative uh, of the father and son of Rebekah. This guy, this guy was not waiting. He, is, he was in a hurry uh, to get connected to this family. Again, uh, he doesn't waste any time. Now you know why it is Rachel who came out and not Leah. And just like Rebecca ran home with great news of uh, Eliezer's uh, presence at the well, we see too uh, Rachel running home with the great news of Jacob's arrival. And we are told that as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, he went to meet him and to welcome him, welcome him home. Remember Laban already had done that with Eliezer. He, still, he went to the well and welcomed Eliezer home. So this time I think he must have been very, very expectant he knew this, uh, uh, the, that family was very wealthy, so he's going to the well, and I'm sure he's also very, very excited. Uh, when you have wealthy relatives coming to visit you, uh, you do get excited. So here, Laban, I don't know what is happening in his head, but I think he remembers the gifts that were given by, by Eliezer uh, the, uh, to, uh, to, for Rebecca, and, uh, and I'm sure now he's looking forward maybe to many more gifts coming uh, from this family. So, again, very uh, amazing, amazing, you know, uh, 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 comparison here between what happened in the case of Rebecca and now in the case of Jacob and this girl, Rachel. Uh, now, we are told that, of course, then uh, Jacob uh, invited this man home. He invited him home. We are told after staying at home for about a month, uh, Laban invited Jacob to work for him, but also he invited him to name the wages. Now, we need to say something which is not said here. In that one month, uh, Laban must have observed this young man, uh, Jacob. First of all, he must have noted that he was in love with, uh, uh, with Rachel. He knew that. He also must have noted that uh, this man, Jacob, was a hardworking man. Very committed, very dedicated, and very serious. So, uh, he, and, uh, he, for that whole month, of course, Jacob worked for Laban without any wages. So, at this point when he's inviting him to not work for nothing, it's because he has seen this is a valuable person to have in his household. And of course, he tells him to name the wages. Now, this was a trick. This was a trick. Those of you who interview people in offices, and we know there's that question we ask people to what salary they would like to earn. And it's a trip question because you're not going to pay anybody the money they want to be paid. You just want them to either to either name too little or name too much and you disqualify them. Either way you lose because whatever uh, figure you mention, it's either for you against you if it's too high, people think you're too greedy. And here Jacob is asked uh, to name the wages. He should have told his father you name the wages. And now, of course, he's going to mention something uh, that is very high up. But we, before we go to uh, Jacob's response, the Bible gives us some background notes. Now we are told that Laban had two daughters. Uh, the name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. We've already met her. Leah had weak eyes, uh, but Rachel had a lovely figure, and she was beautiful. So even the Bible does record that some people have lovely figures, and they are beautiful. So you guys, who, who you thought you are the only one to, you are the first one to see ladies with beautiful figures. No, it's recorded in the Bible. So uh, we take that from you. It's, it's recorded. So, but the point here is, is being recorded. Why this is being recorded? It's because it's going to play out uh, that Leah was not married and, uh, and uh, Jacob was interested in uh, Rachel because she was beautiful. Now this comparison here, at times based on uh, superficial phys physical qualities, at times bothers people, especially in our contemporary society. People who are gender sensitive, they think maybe the Bible is a little bit uh, not sensitive to these girls, describing one as very beautiful and the other one maybe not as beautiful. But remember here, the Bible doesn't uh, hide anything. The Bible uh, describes things the way they are. It's not a judgmental thing. But also the, this description here is here to explain why Leah, the elder sister, was not married. Why she was not married is because she had that issue of the eye. And so Jacob, who was in love with Rachel, remember he's been asked to name his prize. He said, I'll work for you for seven years 
in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So we see he has gone to the beautiful girl who has figure, just like all of you did when you were told to select. <laughs> so uh, choosing by sight, not by faith, he chooses uh, uh, the Rachel. But also know that he chooses uh, to pay to work for seven years. Now, that was not necessary. Uh, we don't know why he chose seven years. Uh, the bride price for a girl, uh, even uh, by those standards of those culture, it was not that high. But Jacob, maybe he wanted to show his commitment for his love. And of course, he names seven years. And of course, he chooses uh, Rachel. And of course, that is a trap he has entered there. Now, the diary equivalent of, Joseph, uh, of Jacob's wage for seven years was far beyond the ordinary. But Laban shrewdly accepted the exorbitant offer. So this man, Jacob, was not a good man. At that point, uh, you, he should have said, well, seven years is too much. Well, let's leave, leave it to two or three or whatever. And, and uh, basically kind of line up things. But of course, here yeah, he takes advantage of Jacob. So you and I need to learn to a point not to take advantage of people. Even when people kind of give us over and above what we're asking, uh, we need to be uh, uh, very, very uh, conscious that God is involved in this. But this man, Laban, was asking a tricky question. Uh, he tripped this young man, and the man has now picked uh, his wage and is going to work uh, for this girl. Now, we also know that despite the cultural norm of not marrying off the, elder, uh, the younger daughter before the older, uh, Laban deceptively accepted Jacob's offer to marry the younger before the older. So he could have said, no, by the way, oh, Jacob, you can't do that. You can't marry uh, Leah, I mean Rachel, because... Uh, the, her elder sister is not married, so you marry Leah. So he did not disrupt that issue. He knew maybe Jacob may refuse. Uh, so he again decept uh, deceptively accepted the offer, even though he knew maybe he was not going to do it. And so we are told Jacob served uh, uh, Laban for seven years, but they seemed only like a few days to him because he loved her greatly. This man was committed. Jacob, despite all his issues, he was committed to Leah. Uh, to Rachel, and he worked for those seven years. He did not ask for any wage. His wages became the dowry. But then, uh, we are told in verse 21, when the seven years were over, this man, uh, Jacob, went to Laban and told him, and, and it's amazing, the words he uses, give me my wife. <laughs> my time is completed, and I want to make love to her. I don't know how many of you would. <laughs> we don't talk to our fathers like that. I don't know. I don't know why Jacob chose to talk to his fathers like that. Again, the Bible didn't cover him. That's what he said. And of course, his father. Now, you and I, young men who are here, don't talk to your uh, father-in-law like that. Uh, just uh, be courteous. And everybody will understand what you want to do. And this brings us to our first principle. <laughs> brings us to our first principle. God's discernible wisdom empowers believers to step out in faith. God's discernible wisdom empowers believers to step out in faith. Everything we've talked about today, we see God's guidance. We see God's provision. We see God's providence. It's God who guided uh, Jacob to the well. It's God who guided Rachel to come out. It's God who guided Laban to go to the well. And everything that is going on, God is involved. Uh, God is involved. And you and I need to know uh, in our lives, even when circumstances are difficult, uh, we can rest that God's discernible wisdom will guide us. Now, where might God's discernible wisdom be calling you to take your next step of faith in service to him? God is always looking for people to serve him. He's always looking for people to be engaged in ministry, in BSF, in your church, at home, in cell groups. God is looking for people to be involved in the cause of Christ in the world. So you and I, you need to figure out where should you be serving God if you're not already serving him. Will you trust and obey and agree to step up in faith and serve God? You need to. You need to step up and serve God. Where has God walked you through discernible circumstances and invited you to take the next step of faith? Many a times in our lives, in our marriages, in our jobs, in our businesses, God can walk you uh, through discernible wisdom on what to do. Uh, God may design you to take this contract, to do that uh, project, this program, and when God does that, uh, then you need to take the step of faith. 
From today, be asking God to guide you with his discernible wisdom. Uh, remind him he guided Eliezer, the Abraham's servant. Remind him that he guided Jacob to the right place, to the right, right family. And God, you and I today, uh, he can do the same for you. Whatever guidance you need today, uh, God is able to do it because of his discernible wisdom. Now, quickly, let's go to our second division and see how God's mysterious uh, wisdom uh, uh, is going to guide Jacob. Now, when we talk of mysterious wisdom, we are talking of uh, hidden. It's wisdom that is not easily discernible. It's wisdom that is hidden. It's wisdom that is difficult to understand. And although the first step, what we've gone through, we see God discernible wisdom. We see God is lining up uh, 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 Jacob's steps. But in the uh, division, we are going to see the wisdom of God is hidden and is more difficult to understand. So let's look at God's mysterious uh, wisdom. So now we see, uh, and here of course God's mysterious wisdom is Jacob marrying Leah. I mean that is hidden. I mean you and I, uh, it's not clear why God would allow that to happen. So that is mysterious wisdom of God. So in verse 22, we see that Laban brought together all the people of the, part of the place and he gave a big wedding feast. So just like in Africa where we like big weddings, that's what uh, Laban did. He, uh, the, the daughter was getting married, and of course, he held this big feast. And of course, we are told that he, when the evening came, Laban substituted Rachel with Leah. And uh, of course, he, uh, it was at night. Uh, most likely, may, people had uh, really uh, indulged. Maybe they were drunk, most likely. And of course, then uh, Jacob was not able to discern that, of course, the girl was veiled. Brides are always veiled. So, of course, he was, he was <clears throat> not able to design the swap. And, of course, we are told that Jacob made love to her, slept with her that night, the bridal night. And, of course, remember, he had told his father he wants his bride. He wants to sleep with her, and, of course, he did. The only problem here, he slept with the, with the wrong one. And, alas, Jacob, the deceiver, has been deceived by his shrewd uncle. And this is the consequence of sin we are talking about. You and I need to learn from Jacob. Because Jacob, his name, actually the name Jacob means uh, heel snatcher, or this streetwise guy, a deceiver. And now we see his uncle is even a better deceiver than Jacob himself. Just when you are very good at deceiving people or being sly with people, be, be aware that Uncle Laban is somewhere waiting for you and he's going to have two or three on you. So when the morning came, we are told that Jacob said to Laban, of course he discovered in the morning, uh, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? So he, you can tell he was uh, very angry. Of course, this really was a very bad uh, deception. Uh, this is a wife now. You've married her. You've slept with her. You can't dishonor her. And of course, uh, uh, Jacob knew as much. And of course, yeah, he's really, really annoyed with his uncle. But let's leave a little bit about Jacob. Imagine the total humiliation for Leah to be rejected by Jacob after sleeping with her. We don't know whether Leo, Leah was part of this scheme, this plot, uh, to be used. Uh, um, we don't know. Maybe the only thing we know or we can guess is that um, maybe she wanted to get married, I'm sure, and maybe she wanted to get a family, have children. So we know maybe when the scheme, the plot came, uh, she also went along. But she was hoping maybe Jacob, after spending the night with her, he would not uh, be this uh, kind of blunt or not like her. But imagine the total humiliation. And you see, this deception here works again as Jacob, works again as Leah, and works even again as Rachel. Where was Rachel when all this was happening? Because Rachel was also in love with Jacob. So you can see what, here what Laban did. In verses 26 to 27, Laban offered no apology, but justified his action. Listen to what he says. It's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. He knew this all along, even seven years before when he accepted uh, uh, Jacob's proposal, but he accepted it. He knew he was going to deceive him. He never mentioned about the culture. So listen to what he tells Jacob. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we'll give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of labor. Really, Uncle Laban? Uncle Laban is a beast. Yes, you've already gotten labor from uh, Jacob for seven years. 
and you've given her the wrong bride, and now you want him to actually work another seven years uh, to give, so then he can get the right bride. So we know what the scheme of Laban was right from the beginning. He saw an opportunity to marry off both his daughters, including the one who was not beautiful. So this is what he did here. Instead of leaving these issues to God, he actually took matters in his own hands. So marrying off the two daughters was one goal of Laban. The second goal, of course, is to get a lot of work done by this young man, Jacob. He didn't want him to marry Rachel and then walk away. He wanted him uh, to marry uh, Rachel, but still remain in the compound working for another seven years. So we see in the process of deceiving Jacob, this man dishonored his two daughters, Leah and Rachel, and these girls will always after this be against the father because of their mistreating, the way he mistreated them. You and I need to pray that we, in our dealing with our children, we become more compassionate and we glorify God in the way we bring them up and even the way we give them out in marriage, it should be done above board. So we are told that after Jacob finished the bridal week with Leah, Laban gave Jacob his daughter Rachel to be his wife and Jacob loved her more trouble. Jacob loved her more than Leah and Leah's humiliation continued. So Laban has just started a process that is going to bring a lot of distress on everyone, on Rachel, on Leah, and now here we are told, oh, this man Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and of course there's a problem with polygamous marriage, and uh, um, it's going to be a very bad uh, marriage environment. So we are told in verse 30 that, so Jacob worked for Laban for another seven years in order to pay dowry for Rachel, uh, and this is nothing but pure, pure suffering. So really this, everybody in this passage, apart from Laban, suffered. Leah suffered, Rachel suffered, Jacob suffered the most. So we need to talk about suffering because uh, Jesus said in this world we'll have a lot of suffering, a lot of problem, uh, but we should be of good cheers. So what is suffering? No, suffering is a painful reality for people living with the consequences of the fall. You know the fall in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. The source of all suffering is the sin in this world. But not all suffering is as direct result of sin. So when you see somebody suffering, don't tell them it's because of their sin. We don't know. But we know that uh, all suffering comes from sin. And uh, not all suffering is directly as a result of sin. Okay? So you have to be careful. Unless God has given you a discernment, don't tell somebody they are suffering because of sin. But because we know there is sin in the world, then we know suffering does come. Suffering has a purpose. We need to know that. God sovereignly uses suffering to discipline and develop and mature his people to accomplish his will. So as we go through suffering, we need to know that there is a purpose for us to be developed, to be matured, so then we can accomplish God's will. We also need to know that God does limit suffering. Uh, he limits suffering. Uh, God has promised that suffering of his people will eventually end. Suffering, we know pain does not last forever. It lasts for a night, for a short period, compared to eternity. So suffering is limited. So as we go through suffering, we need to note that. God is deeply sensitive to our suffering. He empathizes with our mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering that we face. So as we go through suffering, uh, we need to know that God is uh, empath empathizing with us, but also he is deeply involved. Believers can praise God in times of suffering because of the benefits that trials can produce in our lives. So next time you and I go through suffering, like Jacob here, uh, giving labor, uh, Laban seven, uh, 14 years of service, we need to ask God, uh, God, let me know what you're training me in this. So suffering is beneficial to us. So uh, in verses 31 to 35, now we see uh, Jacob is going to have children with Leah. And uh, remember, we already know that he does not love Leah. He loves Rachel uh, more. But we are told that when Lord, the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive and give birth to Reuben. That enabled her to conceive, it means also uh, Rachel was not enabled to conceive. So God is taking sides, and that is, uh, should be very instructive to us. 
when in our marriage environment or in any one situation, when we take sides and we favor other people and not others, God will tend to compensate those who we are not favoring. So here we see God favoring Leah, not Rachel. God enabled her to conceive and give birth. And she gave birth to Reuben. And uh, she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me. This woman was aching for the husband's love. She knew she was not loved. She, uh, she knew that her marriage was a trick. She knew that uh, if uh, Jacob would have a way, he would throw her out. And here she was craving for the husband to love her. And he did not. She conceived again and gave birth to Simeon, saying, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one. So he's naming these children uh, her pain. Her pain. <laughs> she's giving them the names of her pain. Again, we are told again, she conceived the third time and called that child Levi, uh, now, saying, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've born him three sons. Now, of course, you know sons are valued uh, in our culture and in this Middle Eastern culture is the same. But again, no love was forthcoming. She conceived the fourth time, gave birth to Judah, saying, this time I'll praise the Lord. Uh, now, we need to note how this woman has been transformed by her suffering. From grumbling and complaining about not being loved, by the time she gets Judah, she names him praise, and she says, this time I'll praise the Lord. She stopped looking for love from Jacob, and she realized, indeed, God loves her. You and I, when we go through suffering, uh, we need to know that God is involved. He's empathizing. That's what we just said. And that God is spiritually, he's mentally, uh, he's basically involved in our suffering. And we see in the case of Leah that God is involved. He's engaged. And that this time, this woman realizes God is involved and she stops to complain. And now she gives praise to God. Now, we know that although Leah longed to be loved by Jacob, and Jacob did not love her, we know that she received a lot of honor from among the women in that society. As she was giving birth to these sons, the women in the society were giving glory to God because when you give birth, it shows that family has continuity. But also we know this woman was being blessed by the Almighty God. We know she was being blessed by Almighty God. You and I need to learn to look for whatever need we have to God. We need to take all our needs and desires to God because God is the one who can give us that unconditional love and he did give, give it to us through Christ. Now we know that Leah's third born, Levi, was appointed by God to form the line of priests called the Levites. So you can see how God was working through Leah. Although she was not loved, God was uh, having a plan that the children who come out of her are going to be strategic uh, in the kingdom of God. So uh, Levi will be uh, the one who will start the Levite priesthood. And also we know the fourth son, uh, Judah, was going to be the great ancestor of King David and the, uh, one of the great, great, great grandfathers of uh, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is from the tribe of Judah. And you can see from this woman who was not loved, from this woman who was in a bad marriage, God is able to get children who are going to be uh, pillars in the kingdom of God. And this leads us to our second principle. God's mysterious wisdom guides hurting believers to fulfill their destiny. God's mysterious wisdom guides hurting believers to fulfill their destiny. We may not always understand what God is doing in our lives, but God is accomplishing uh, his plans and purposes for us. Even when it's mysterious, when it's hidden, we do not understand. It's difficult to see what God is doing with the suffering we are going through. Like Rachel here, I mean Leah here, uh, God was still doing, uh, fulfilling his eternal plan. You and I, as we go through suffering, may not understand what is God is doing. In our marriages, in our businesses, in our workplaces, with our children, with our neighbors, we may never understand what is God is, God is doing but we call that God's mysterious wisdom. He is still uh, using the heart, using the suffering uh, in us to fulfill, to help us fulfill our destiny. So we should not despair. So how has God's mysterious wisdom intentionally directed your life at a pivotal moment such as rejection, sickness, or death? Many a times when we are rejected, when we are sick, or when there is death in our family, 
Uh, we should be looking out for God's mysterious wisdom to guide us. We may not understand death. We may not understand rejection. We may not even understand weakness. Why do we get sick? Why do we get unwell? But we can ask God uh, to help us. Even in our hurting, in our pain, uh, we can ask him to direct us through his mysterious wisdom. How has unexpected hardship in your life led you to depend on God in a way, in a new way, and fulfill his destiny? Unexpe un unexpected hardship, suffering, trouble in our lives, it's not a waste. We, that should help us to lean on God and should help us to fulfill our destiny. In fact, I tell men when things are very smooth in your life, most likely you're not doing anything in the kingdom. Because your faith will be tested, we should be expecting our pain, suffering, and we also expect God to use that. As a believer, what do you do with Laban's in your life? What do you do with Laban's in your life? Laban is there. Whether you know him or not, he's there to inflict pain and to inflict suffering. At work, people will deny you promotion, elevation, recognition. Uh, people will plagiarize uh, your, your work and give it and they get a pay rise. Uh, what do you do with Laban in your life? A question you need to answer. Do you forgive them? Take them to court? Pray for them? Forgive them? And serve for 14 years? Maybe uh, you need to make up your mind what you need to do with Laban's in your life. In conclusion, please remember that God's wisdom prevails to accomplish for God's good purposes for our lives, often time through trouble. God's wisdom prevails to accomplish God's good purposes for our life, often time through suffering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because you are wise God, and through your wisdom, God, you are able to guide us, uh, even to be able to fulfill our destiny, and Father, even to be able uh, to fulfill the plans you have for us. Help us, Father, when we are lost in this world, when we are suffering in this world, help us to know that, God, we can depend on you, we can lean on you, and you are able to guide us, direct us, oh God. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.